Hi, this is Paisley Therese. This is Dr. Crow. And welcome to episode six, six. of us playing Civ Six as the Ottomans. I got it. Nice. Yes. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> So in the last episode, we got Cairo. It was a little um, dangerous, but yeah. we got peace with Arabia, and now we can start moving towards um, maybe Poland, maybe more um, Hungary. Hungary. Yeah. Yeah, and we have troops moving to Hungary on this front. Um, in the last episode, I did something a little rash that I very much regret like the second after I thought about it, which was settling Adana on the Niter. I don't know why I did that. I was just kind of like lured in by the Niter, but the whole plan of Adana was to get a road to this side of the map mm -hmm. and to also upgrade my units to Janissaries, but I only have three tiles to do it now. So that was like a huge mistake and I highly, very much regret it, um, <laughs> but I will live with it. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I think none of these cities are happening. It was plans I had made that um, are just not going to not going to happen. So mm -hmm. let's remove those pens. OK. And yeah, so let's think about the goals for this episode. I'm thinking we want to get to Janissaries as soon as possible. Um, I'm building an armory right now for the boost. OK. After that, I think I'll just go straight for banking or yeah banking right here or maybe some maybe bombard thing, yeah we'll see um depending on the science and then um i guess that's it and also oh yes so because of my mistake with adana i need to flip bologna mm -hmm. um which i've been working on i think for uh so i can upgrade units in there okay so that's kind of one of the goals, which means I do need trade routes. So that's what I'm going to do now. And last episode... Um, you got a great person as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like in such a rush to like just stop playing. I was so stressed that I didn't even notice. We have a great person and uh, apparently we have a great profit. I wasn't working for one, but I'll take it. Yeah. I guess it's because of these two yeah. uh, shrines. That so that's great. Sense. Yeah, so I'm going to buy trade routes now to flip Bologna using that. Perfect. And um, last episode, we said we'd start off talking a little bit about Adana. So do you want to do that? Sure. So Adana is a city on the southern Mediterranean coast of Turkey. It is a uh, port city. It is well known for its spicy food. Um, I think people think Turkish food is spicy. But it's not usually very spicy, except for certain dishes. But I don't know if food is quite spicy. Um, it was not really a huge city in Ottoman times, but really expanded in the 19th century, and then particularly in the 1960s, 1970s, mm -hmm. when there's this big wave of urbanization in Turkey. Uh, so during that time, Istanbul, for example, moves from about 1 million people to nowadays something like 20 million. So... Right. Yeah, and then so what other, like, where is it on the map and what other um, cities are around there? Yeah, so in terms of other cities, um, to the west, there is a city that if you are German or Russian, you probably know very well, Antalya. Uh, it's like a resort city, has some nice beaches. Um, I think now it's one of the larger cities in Turkey as well. I think maybe number five, number six. Right. And uh, Antalya has like these old city walls, which are really interesting. Yeah, it has a nice old city. Yeah. So it was a Byzantine city, right? Um, yeah. And, but even before that, it was... Yeah, I mean, it was like a Greek city. Yeah. yeah it's, a quite, it's a pretty old city, actually. Um, but it was not very big until modern times. Right. Um, secondarily, if we go to the east we have a number of very ancient very important cultural cities uh urfa is one um antep is another one also a very famous food city yeah for baklava and um pistachios right yeah yeah for sure um i know you're not the biggest fan of baklava i don't know if i want the world to know <laughs> that i hate baklava but unfortunately that is the case yeah <laughs> Uh, um, it's a lasting shame. I know. All my friends uh, hate me for it. We have one friend who just loves uh, Antepli baklava. They just, they cried 
um, having some at Gulyolu in Istanbul. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely a weirdo. Um, <laughs> but most people like baklava. I just don't like sweet things. I, I don't like chocolate. I like dark chocolate only. Right. I like coffee. You know, I heard that sociopaths like bitter food. <laughs> Um, so that might so watch out. <laughs> that might explain it. Um, um, in addition to Antep, we have towards more the south, um, the cities of Iskenderun, which uh, used to be called Alexandretta, and we have Antakya, which used to be called Antioch. Right, and we had someone ask me on Twitter, like, why is Antioch in Civ Six? Um, a trading state like what is up with their bonus do you know about that and unfortunately i have no idea <laughs> do you wanna <laughs> do you want to give a guess yeah i would assume it has to do with its importance as a trading city yeah i mean it's it was one of the uh end points of the silk road and ooh, can we get vilnius yeah i'm thinking okay i'm trying to figure this out because i forgot i have a money that I can move into Bologna, that gives me six. So I need to save one more for them. Yeah. Uh, and I have two envoys left. Um, we should be able to get Vilnius, though. Yeah, because I feel like this is a better road. Yeah, for sure. And then here, I can do Vilnius again, or I can do Zanzibar and get my suzerainty back with them and get a better gold okay. deal. And then um, I can put one into Vilnius and save one for Bologna. Okay. I think that's the plan. Okay. Nice. So I'm maxed out on my trade routes now, which gives me the boost. So that nice. was the plan. And then I think after that, I was thinking, do we go for our four tier government or do we just go for guilds to get the banking boost? Mm -hmm. um, and I think I want to do guilds after. I don't know. Okay. I still have time to, I have one turn to think about okay. it. <laughs> but yeah, speaking of gold city states, so Antioch is, um, uh, a trading city, right? Yeah, yeah. Where um, it was. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Antioch in the classical era was, I mean, one of the biggest cities in the world. So it's not quite as important in Ottoman times, but it still is a really important, you know, trading nexus. And uh, later on in the 19th century, it'll be kind of displaced by new cities like Beirut, um, Haifa, right? But during, you know, previous Decades and previous centuries, um, yeah, Antakya, along with Damascus, Aleppo, uh, Homs, Hama, are really important uh, trading cities. Right, and this book that sort of I was, um, I don't know what's the word, that I was like, I wasn't reading because I haven't gone to yet, that I was <laughs> planning, about. yeah, that I heard about, that I was planning on reading, um, was about the long durée, or we can say deep history of Antioch. And that's something, you know, that's like a methodology you can use in history. Uh, so do you want to talk a little bit about different methodologies? Sure. So, yeah, there's a lot of words for this kind of history that is about really um, taking very, very long term, very global trends and using that to describe a specific instance. So that's sometimes called uh, long history, deep history, thick history, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> broad history. So a lot of very erotic terms. <laughs> um, oh but um, yeah, so that's one way. The kind of classical example is Braudel's, Fernand Braudel's History of the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. in which he wants yeah, to describe okay. the kind of socio-political circumstances of Philip II's reign in I believe he's in Civ, the leader of Spain. Yes, yes. Um, but in order to describe what's going on in his reign, he's like, well, I need to start with the Ice Age <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and think about how the Mediterranean formed and the climate and the soils, right? So that's the kind of prototypical deep history, right. long durée history. Um, the kind of history that I personally prefer is what's called microhistory which is the exact opposite. It's taking a single, very small, you know, instance, like a single person, single space, single event, and then bring out from that more global or more macro processes. Um, there's a very famous example, which is called The Cheese and the Worms right. by uh, Carlo Ginsberg, where he's just looking at this one, I think he's a miller, 
and he has this very weird idiosyncratic worldview in which the universe formed the same way that like mold forms on cheese uh, or worms form out of cheese and uh yeah he's just taking this one person who otherwise would just seem like a normal individual and trying to bring out how that reflects the kind of early modern worldview um, it's a very interesting book. I think it's like one of the uh, must reads for like yeah, first year PhD students yeah. when they're doing like their methods class. For sure. Um, yeah, even if you're doing sort of like a not European history, it's still interesting to think about the ways that you can sort of create these narratives and tap into the uh, sources that we have. Yeah. And for Ottomans, we have other sources like the Barber of Damascus, I think is sort of a comparable story. Yeah, yeah. A similar story in which it's a barber, not a miller, who is... Uh, <laughs> Surprising. Who, yeah, who is, who is basically writing, like, I guess he has like a kind of writing mania or something, so he just keeps writing. Writing mania? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, people just need to write, you know? Yeah. So he is uh, just writing down these journals, but, you know, is reflecting his worldview and uh yeah we really see how like an average person would have understood the politics of that time right and that's one of the good things about micro history is that we learn you know kind of history from below right it's history that's not just about kings and about empires and about you know this uh battle affected this but it's really about like how did a person live in that time Right. Um, so why is it that you like that kind of history more? Like people would argue that history from above is more consequential, right? Yeah, I mean, currently I think the dominant form of history or the most in fashion form are these deeper, broad histories because our interest right now is, I think, shaped by things like climate, mm -hmm. disease. So not deeper, but broader. Broader, yeah, but also deeper. I mean, <laughs> okay, what you know, do you mean? Because like climate, you know, climates are very long-term processes, right? right? Like you can't talk about the climate changing from one year to the next, right? Right. Um, although I don't think anyone's ever done a weather history, which could be interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, there's the, the Little Ice Age. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Who is that? Something green? Uh, no, that can't be right. Sam White. Sam something? White. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking of like color. color. <laughs> color. <laughs> yeah, so Sam White does like... Sam Purple. <laughs> <laughs> histories of climate, um, but they're also micro-histories. Well, they're, they're more in the macro side. He's not really dealing with, like, a specific... Because the micro history should be, like, the history of... For example, one would be a history of a single, like, very short event. Like, people in Paris, for some reason, turned against their cats at one point in, like, the 18th century. Right? Is this a true? Is this, <laughs> this just is an example? No, this is a true example, right? They really started... <laughs> It was like a it was like a fad where people started like killing cats oh and hating God. cats and uh, eating cats up, right? Please <laughs> close your ears. Yeah, Don't our, listen. That's our cat. <laughs> um, She's sitting right there. You know, and like in terms of like political, it has no political significance. Like it's just something that happened, right? But what do you? Mean? It must have some significance. <laughs> but the point is, okay, what does this say about their conceptions about you know cats? <laughs> not just cats, but all kinds of things, right? Like how is this a reaction to? How you know how is this like? them displacing their concerns about something else onto these cats, right? Right. Um, Sad. But yeah, because I think, you know, with climate change, with COVID, with all this stuff, like we're, right now, I think the fashion really is for these very, like, broad histories of, like, um, you know, trying to give, like, well, an example would be, I think, a recent book by David Graeber and... Mm -hmm. Some other guy, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, which is a, kind of like a new history of everything or something, right? And that's the kind of classic example where right. it's like trying to tell you the history of human, you know, like uh, thought or human societies, right? right? Um, whereas for micro history, you know, uh -oh. our cat heard the story about. <laughs> Hi, I'm a kitten. I'm from Turkey. Hello. Yeah. Okay, you gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that one, actually, I saw there's some, like, beef on Twitter. Not on Twitter, just, like, in the academic world about yeah. that book, right? Yeah. What's his name came out with, like, a review about it? Appiah? Yeah, yeah Appiah, he does work on cosmopolitanism. I'm just confused how people um, <laughs> claim so much as their expertise. Like, yeah. I feel like I wouldn't ever feel comfortable talking about 
archaeology if I'm I mean, not an archaeologist. I can barely talk about like the 15th century Ottomans, right? Like I'm just like spitballing for a lot of that. When it's not the 19th century, I'm like, uh, you know, so like how can I talk about a field that's not even my field, right? Like, yeah. But so if you're interested, you can find uh, Apia's reviews and then there's like the responses by the authors. Yeah. So there's some drama going on about that. But I guess it's like at the heart of it, it's the question of like, how do we know history and how do we do history? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of the histories that I'm in part that you read are going to be broad histories, like general histories, right? Which will say like, right. Yeah, why did it decline? Why did it do this, right? Why didn't the Ottomans colonize Europe or whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. like... And so, yeah, for me personally, you know, I feel like broad, deep, whatever histories can be done very well, but they can also gloss over all the particularities, mm -hmm. right? Which, and I think the, the interesting things in history come out of particularities all right. the time. Yeah. Build some farms. Yeah. And sort of speaking about what you do, Eric, uh, we had a question about languages. Yeah. Um, so do you want to give like a little bit more of a general overview about sort of the languages used in the Ottoman Empire? And then also what's the difference between Ottoman Turkish and like contemporary Turkish? Sure. So two big questions. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think we're going to get a it depends answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It definitely. I'll, I won't say it depends, but it's uh, it, it varies based on your idea of what a language should be. Right. So we have an idea of language, which is very much the product of national education systems, nation states, national histories, which says that there is a language for a nation, right? And that every nation has a language and that, you know, there's a very hard boundary between, for instance, you know, German and Polish, right? Uh, or English and French, right? Like that's the national border and there's where the languages have a border. In the Ottoman context, that's not really the case, right? Because firstly, um, these languages, there was a kind of fluidity between them. Um, we have things like lingua franca, which referred to an actual language, which was just this mix of all the languages of the Mediterranean. So Arabic, Greek, Italian, French, Spanish, Turkish, right? all forms this one big mix called lingua franca right and so we get the term from and ottoman is kind of like this it's a mix of you know turkish grammar with persian vocabulary and arabic vocabulary and different elements of grammar that are brought together and you can have whole pieces that are in what you could call arabic or persian but they're still ottoman right it's still in the field of ottoman yeah and i saw someone saying like it's different when turkish uh absorbs Arabic because they're like not related languages mm -hmm. versus French and English are both European languages, which uh, I'm no expert, <laughs> but they're also not the same family, right? Well, yeah, one is Germanic, <laughs> one is Romance, but also, I mean, English is a really bad example because English was kind of like Ottoman in the sense that medieval English, right, was this mixture of like kind of Germanic grammar with huge amounts of French vocabulary huge amounts of Norse vocabulary, any kind of intellectual stuff came from Latin or Greek later on. So all these things kind of mash together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, English is kind of like Ottoman in that sense that if you were an English educated person, you were expected to know Latin, French, and English, and you would kind of move in between, right? right. If you had to do a legal case, you'd have to know either Latin or French. Um, if you had to speak to someone, you need to know kind of English, right? So. <laughs> And Ottoman is like that too. So there was a kind of presumption that an educated Ottoman bureaucrat intellectual should know or be completely conversant in Arabic, Persian, Turkish. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, the Ottoman language itself has a lot of, um, yeah, just kind of not even having these boundaries, right? These boundaries become more stylistic than linguistic. Um, for that reason, it's very different from the modern Turkish language, which is more of a kind of national language in the sense that we understand it today. Um, because there was this huge reform process in the 20th century, which began in the 19th century, but really took place in the 1920s, 1930s, in which script was changed, grammar was simplified, uh, huge amounts of vocabulary was changed. Mm -hmm. um, 
like almost all these words of Arabic, Persian. Yeah. You know. And like, what's the process of changing? Like, how do you go about changing a language, right? Like, this is not well, a simple task. <laughs> the script reform, they did it in three months. <laughs> so it was quite a fast thing. Yeah. It just, it just said, okay, like, three months from now, we're not printing anything in an old script. So you better learn it, you know? Um, I mean, there's a lot of like, I don't know, in the uh, people we've spoken to who are native speakers of Turkish or Turkic languages, yeah. there's a lot of, I I would say, um, controversy or like contention. Um, some people are really happy that it changed and some people are very upset that, you know, they can't walk around Istanbul and read like the uh, inscriptions on buildings. Mm -hmm. But like, for example, we have a friend who is like her native tongue is Azeri, mm -hmm. um, which is like a Turkic language and they still use the Persian slash Arabic script. But she always makes this joke about um, in Turkish, you can say oldum, meaning I was, right? Or uldum, which means I died. And in the Arabic script, you write it exactly the same, so... <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of words, like, um, I'll just say it in English, there's like K-U-R-K, -K, which can be read in Turkish as like 40 different words, but it's all the same <laughs> letters in Ottoman script. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, my personal philosophy is I don't think languages can ever be impoverished or rich or capable versus incapable i think languages are constantly changing and evolving so i don't think that the language for process is like a catastrophe but you know i think both people both sides have points right like on one hand um yeah clearly the modern turkish alphabet is vastly clearer than yeah. <laughs> the Ottoman script. At the same time, yeah, I mean, there is a kind of disconnection because all the historical documents, all the inscriptions, all the stuff has to be translated back into modern Turkish, right? Um, and you lose a lot of context in that, in, in doing so. Um, so there is a kind of a disconnect, right? And I think, you know, nowadays, um, people are trying to kind of revive Ottoman learning in high school, trying to kind of revive it and, and learn more Arabic and Persian. Um, also because of the, you know, changing, um, alignments, know, uh, yeah, alignments and even demographics of, of Turkey. Right. Um, but, um, yeah, it's still a very big divide. Um, and probably the number of people who know Ottoman is... Uh, in modern Turkey, it can't be more than like five percent. Right. So. Um, I just got Janissaries. I wasn't really paying attention, <laughs> uh, but I don't think I'm ready to upgrade until I go there. And I think I flipped Bologna, right? Yeah, it looks like it. Oh no, I need to put in one more, and then we can start moving in. Oh, okay. Nice. Great. Perfect. Vilnius is really. Uh... <gasps> Wait, did they get rid of a city? <laughs> I don't know. Did they? Yeah, what the hell, Vilnius? I was gonna take it for myself. Well, there's still this one down here, Miss Coke. Yeah, but what the hell? Is, they just took a city? <laughs> Are they allowed to do that? This is the second city raised that was going to be mine. Yeah. Um, wow. Anyways, I guess it wasn't that important. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what do I build now? I think I want to start trebuchets. Trebuchets? Is that what they're called? <laughs> um... And then we can go to Bombards. That sounds good. And then, yeah, I just got a horseman because I, like, I saw some barbarians coming up. Um, bandits. Yeah, bandits. Sorry. <laughs> uh, let it go, Eric. That's, <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> um, and then, does anyone want to trade with me? Just Arabia. I don't want to give them open no orders. Way. Yeah. Um, and then I'm not going to promote owls because I want my own grand bazaars, not the vaults. So I'm going to try to like get as many grand bazaars as I can and then promote to the third level. That makes sense. Um, but I will promote this uh, Ibrahim Pasha soon. Okay. Anyways, go ahead. Keep talking. Keep, keep entertaining <laughs> with history. Um, <laughs> or languages, right? Sure, we can talk a little bit more about languages. Um, so... Uh, right, so how do they go about changing a language, right? So you said the script's done in three months. Yeah, and then the process of changing the vocabulary takes many years. Um, there's a period in which, like, 
because they're trying to find new words to replace these Persian and, and Arabic words, or words that are assigned as Persian or Arabic. Mm -hmm. And um, to do so, like, a lot of them involve, like, weird back formations of, like, Turkish stems or, like, uh, philological or, like, archaeological stuff. Oh, no. Not again. Not again. I'm surprised I have four Diplo favor. Okay. Good, 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 good. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, um, so there's a period of time in the 1920s, uh, 1930s, where um, there's basically like a handbook, and you're supposed to write everything in Ottoman and then just replace all the words out of this, from this handbook of like new words. So for a period, it was just kind of chaotic, right? <laughs> but nowadays, a lot of these words... You know, people don't even know that they're new words, right? People don't even know that they're from the Republic era. So, Can you give some examples? Um, one time I was reading Ottoman for Friend, and there was the phrase Ozaman, uh, which is like, and then, you know, or, or that time. And, uh, yeah, he's like, Uzman, which is like, Expert, and that's a very clearly Republic era word. And the teacher got kind of mad. She's like, what are you, <laughs> what are you talking? <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, well, how do I get through here? Why is this builder right there? <laughs> What's he even doing there? I don't know. What are you going to build there, man? <laughs> uh, but I can move through with okay. some of them. Yeah, that's good. Let's see. And then this one can upgrade there. Right, and then, so like, Persian has the same thing happening, I think a little bit later, right? It's not the same time, where there's this ministry of language that is assigned a job of replacing all, like, foreign loan words with national Persian, what they consider Persian words. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, you know, like, Instead of using the word computer in Turkish, they use bilgi sayed, which means like. Yeah. What like, is it like? What does it translate to? It's like knowledge, like information counter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so like that was a conscious choice to use a, like a Turkish compound instead of. A loan word. Yeah. A loan word. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, many words don't catch on, um, mm -hmm. but they have a ministry which is in charge of making new words. Um, but yeah, a lot of languages have that, like French has that as well. Um, it really goes to show you how constructed nationalism is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, did we get Estergom? What? Oh, yeah! <laughs> Where? Yeah, I did get it. Wow, nice. Nice, thanks. I totally forgot. Um, <laughs> let's keep the city. Yeah. Great, that's awesome. Um, but we can go keep going a little bit more until we get our first Janissary. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. We do have this Hungarian crossbowman right there. I'm hoping the swordsman, which isn't mine, will bait the attack there. Okay. And then just repairing along here, maybe make another farm. I only have one more charge left. I think I'll make a farm and then do my um, diplomatic quarter here. Because I'm thinking I'm going to like centralize trade routes from Baghdad. That makes sense. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Um, one last thing about Ottoman literature, which I can talk about. Um, so as uh, I think I mentioned, right, there's this very um, important tradition of poetry called Divan poetry, which is the kind of yeah, elite literary culture of the Ottoman Empire is this um, very, um, very complex, ornate, poetic style. Um, and because the kind of aesthetic of this was a, of a kind of complete literary work of art in the sense that, you know, there is, um, it fits perfectly within this meter, it is having all this like you know reference to previous works and is referencing itself referencing the shape of the letters in the text and because every letter in the ottoman script has a numeric value assigned to it also all the numbers in that poem would add up to like an important date sometimes mm -hmm. and, i remember seeing yeah, that and yeah. then it's written in a, in a calligraphy right so also the visual aspect is you know there so it was really viewed as kind of this like the ideal form of Ottoman divan poetry was of this almost complete aesthetic, right? 
Um, which makes it sometimes very difficult to translate because you lose all of those, you know, references in the text. Um, but there are good translations of some Divan poetry. And there's also pretty good translations of Ottoman prose. Uh, and the most famous prose text probably is the travelogue of Evliya Chelebi. Right. Um, Evliya was a uh, 17th century traveler who went pretty much all around the Ottoman Empire, a little bit around Europe, um, a little bit in Iran. And he has all these fun observations. He writes in a very kind of interesting, a little bit fanciful style. Um, so he can't always take his text as like a history text, mm -hmm. but it's it's definitely a fun read to get the Ottoman kind of like conceptualization of certain things and Evelia's particular conceptualization of, you know, different countries around the world. He's kind of positive about Hungary, actually. <laughs> he likes the Hungarians, but he... But he, he hates uh, Aust <laughs> Austrians, right? What was that phrase he uses? Yeah, he says like, you know, the Hungarians may be barbarians, but at least they're honorable, <laughs> and the Austrians are... <laughs> Or neither, right? Like they're both barbarians. And <laughs> no, dishonorable. no offense, Austrians. We don't, we don't condone that message. Yeah. Um, I mean, it did start two world wars, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, I am about to upgrade my Janissaries. Ooh. Let's watch this happen. Here we go. So wow. score. How much niter is? I, I have the card in, right? Five niter. Yes. Wow. Great. It's cheap. Yes, very cheap. Um, People say you shouldn't build uh, men-at-arms to upgrade into Janissaries because the production for men-at-arms is, like, more mm. than Janissaries. Before you do that, it does look like the Byzantines are going to attack. Are they? Are they at war? Let's see. Oh. Can we I... make them make peace? Is there a way to do that? Make other people make peace? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do I do that? Huh. Uh, yeah, I was playing Alpha Centauri. You know, which is like the 1998 version, like sequel to Civ 2, I think. Really? Yeah, and you can ask people to make peace with. I mean, I've never tried it, make demand. No, I don't no. think there's any option. But it's fine. Like, I can just try to snipe the city or... We have our roads. Hopefully, it should be a little bit... Yeah, I don't know if I can get there in time. Maybe, do what, if we just, what if we just move one guy, like one man-at-arms there and then wait? For the Byzantines to bring it down and then just move. Yeah, I do have my horsemen there, so hopefully it, that's it doesn't enough. doesn't have, have a person in there. Like, you pretty easily get it there. Um, not with a horseman. So I'll, I'll try, but I'm pretty far. Like, I don't I don't know how many. I'm, like, probably five turns away from getting to the city. Okay. Um, anyways, where was I? My capital. Yes, I'm building Trebuchet. Chibachets. Trebuchet? Trebuchets, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I am joking. Um, Is that a battering ram? Yeah, I don't know what that's for. I guess to take this uh, <laughs> Arabian city here. So, I don't know, like, should I... Some serious barbarian city. Ugh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I got a horseman, so hopefully that's enough. Might not be. And let's check on religion. Okay, good. There's two, at least. Yeah. Um, let's see the victory here. Okay, I'm I'm Muslim, so that should be enough. I'm gonna wait to use my religion until yeah. I have like more cities with hopefully holy sites, so mm -hmm. that as soon as I found my religion, all of them will switch over. That That's my sense. goal, unless it's like an emergency and someone's winning religious okay. victory. So let's do one more turn and then let's. Uh, yeah. Look at these janissaries. Yeah, and maybe next episode we can talk about the janissaries. That sounds good. Um. Okay. I'm going to leave this decision for later. I just want to think about it a little bit. But here is our situation. We have Janissaries looking good. Yeah, very here nice. Nice hats. Yeah. And we are going to upgrade everyone, move into this city, hopefully get it before the Byzantines do. Yeah. And um, start moving towards Buddha, I guess. Yeah, maybe buy a trebuchet here. We'll see. Okay, I can think about it between episodes. So next time we'll talk about Janissaries, right? Yeah, be... a little bit more about Janissaries, and then we can answer some more questions too. Yeah, and then maybe I'll get the Barbary Corsair next episode. I think I already unlocked it, right? Yeah, it's already unlocked, so maybe okay. I can get one in our naval, a single sad naval city here. <laughs> and we can talk about the Navy and the Kitab al next time. That sounds good. Thanks. 
thanks for watching. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions or want us to talk about other historical details. We'll definitely do that. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.